Hello and welcome to Winter Park Professional Women Virtual Edition. My name is Tiffany Cahill and I am the Events Manager at the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce. We are thrilled to have Angie Gallo with us, um, Orange County School Board member from District 1, um, as we hear from her about the reopening of schools. Um, but before we get to our featured speaker, um, we do want to encourage all of our attendees to engage in some virtual networking. And we ask that you do that via the chat box. If you hover on the bottom of your screen, if you're on Zoom, uh, go to that chat box icon and you will be able to um, engage in some networking there. Let us know who you are, who you're with, and any updates you'd like uh, us to hear about. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, welcome. We encourage you to uh, engage in some virtual networking in the comment section, uh, as well as any questions that anyone may have throughout this program, feel free to drop them in the Facebook comments, or if you're watching on Zoom, we encourage you to write your questions in that Q&A box um, feature, which is also located uh, in that uh, toolbar that will hover um, as you hover over the bottom of your screen, it'll appear. So. Any questions you may have moving forward um, for Angie or um, for any of us, feel free to add that um, to the Q&A feature. Um, we are so thrilled that we're able to continue our uh, programming virtually through these webinars. Um, we started this uh, back when all of this uh, first happened back in March and continuing on being able to convene people um, and, and continue on with our mission by doing these webinars is something we're very thrilled that we're able to do um, as we are able to connect with our members in the community. So without um, further ado, I'd like to first of all um, thank the presenting sponsor of this program, the Winter Park Professional Women Program, and that is Orlando Health. They are what make this possible. Uh, we wouldn't uh, be able to put on this program without our partners um, at Orlando Health. So I want to uh, welcome our speaker from Orlando Health today, Elizabeth Watkins. Elizabeth, Elizabeth serves as the local government affairs and public policy manager at Orlando, Orlando Health, where she is part of a team that leads advocacy efforts to place the organization in the best possible position to effectively serve the healthcare needs of the community. Before Orlando Health, Elizabeth served over 10 years in community development and advocacy roles for large healthcare-focused nonprofits, the American Heart Association and the American Cancer Society. Always passionate about government, Elizabeth studied political science at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and has spent time both in Tallahassee and on Capitol Hill. She is currently pursuing her master's in corporate communication and public relations at Northeastern University. Elizabeth, welcome and thank you so much for being with us and for your support of this program. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Elizabeth Watkins and I am the local government affairs and public policy manager for Orlando Health. Um, as always, our organization is proud to continue the support of the work of the Winter Park Chamber in this professional women series. You know, a couple months ago, I had the privilege of attending a meeting and speaking uh, in the pre-COVID world to all of you and was so excited to come back and, and see you all here today. My role since then has actually changed since last time I visited and I wanted to share a little insight into what I now do, um, which is I work to connect our mission with uh, local elected officials and entities, including schools, which I know is a lot of what you're going to talk about here today. Since the last time I was able to visit, a lot has happened not only in my professional life, but the world, um, certainly for us in the healthcare space. So I wanted to share that over the last few months, our medical experts and overall system have been responding to the pandemic, uh, treating those affected and learning a lot along the way. And you know, we are all now learning to live in a new reality alongside the pandemic. And with all of it, our goal is still to be the best community partners. Whether it's being subject matter experts to safely open businesses, socialize, or even return to school. Orlando Health is working hard with the community to continue on as safe and strong as ever. As we respond to the ever-changing challenges of COVID-19, the safety and well-being of your family and our care teams continue to be our top priorities. And our teams are expertly trained and dedicated to serving you. Regardless of your medical need, you can have confidence knowing that we are prepared to provide the same great care you have come to expect, to expect from us. And this includes bringing our services closer to you, as you are probably familiar with our recently opened medical pavilion in Winter Park. 
Uh, this two-story, 20,000 plus square foot Orlando Health Women's Pavilion is a new healthcare experience designed exclusively for women. We are there um, with an expert team of specialists providing care and of course the high level of infection prevention, screening patients and visitors with uh, in encouraging social distancing. The pavilion services include aesthetics and reconstructive surgery, behavioral health, breast care, obstetrics and gynecology, and much more. I want to personally thank Betsy and the whole team for allowing us to be a part of this series. We truly value this partnership and this wonderful organization and look forward to the great program you have lined up today. So thank you for having us. We, we love being here. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, um, for joining us and for being um, a a sponsor of this great organization. Um, my name is Jen Bishop and I am a team member of the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce. And as um, Tiff mentioned earlier, we are so thrilled and grateful to have Angie Gallo from the Orange County School Board District 1 here. We know how um, busy she is right now and just um, can't thank her enough. Angie was elected in 2018 and is serving her first term as the Orange County School Board member. And she's been volunteering in Orange County for over 20 years. She served as PTA president at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, and also sat on the Orange County Council PTA PTSA Board of Directors. In addition to PTA, Angie has also served as a school advisory committee chair for East Lake Elementary and served on the SAC at Corner Lake Middle and East River High. She's also a graduate of the inaugural class 20. 10 of the OCPS Leadership Orange Program. And she recently served as the Legislation Chair for Florida PTA. Um, again, Angie, thank you so much for being here and we're gonna turn it over to you. Well, oh, Angie, it looks like you are on mute. <laughs> That mute button gets me every time. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I am. We just ended our terms with the Florida PTA, so I am now the formal vi former vice president of educational development with Florida PTA. But I will remain on their board of directors for this upcoming year. It's my pleasure to be with all of you today. I know there's a lot of uncertainty and questions surrounding the reopening of schools and what will it look like. We've worked hard all summer long. None of us have really had any vacations, um, especially our cabinet within the districts. They've been working really hard to try to figure out next steps. How do we juggle COVID-19 and get kids back in the classroom where they need to be and what do, how do we do so safely and to make sure that our employees are safe and our kids are safe. So there was a lot, a lot to tackle early on um, when we closed down because we stopped in March and we thought we'd come back. So at spring break, we were told we're going to shut down for another week to kind of, you know, disinfect, sanitize, get everything clean, and then bring the kids back two weeks later or a week later, we all know that that didn't happen. And then we eventually kept pushing it off, pushing it off, and then had to close the doors and just went digital for that last nine weeks. It was hard. Um, some teachers, many of our teachers did a fabulous job with the digital learning. It was a pivot. It was something that we had to move to quickly. We had spring break and then the following week really to get it together, to put a plan in place. Um, for children and for our teachers. And I have to say, I'm so proud of all of our employees, our teachers, our classified staff, all those who stepped up and just worked so hard to make this happen. We had the food and nutrition people that continue to this day to give away uh, meals at I think 50 sites across, across the county for those students that need it. Um, so I'm just really proud of what we will we were able to accomplish during that pandemic, during this pandemic when we had to close down in the spring. We recognized very early on, uh, right after school ended, that if we had to go digital, if this, if this pandemic didn't clear, if we didn't have a vaccine in time and we had to start looking at what reopening would look like for Orange County Public Schools, that we had to come up with a different plan. What we did in the spring was a pivot, and it was something that we did just to fill the needs to, so that we did not have a, a tremendous amount of learning loss. Um, but we recognized that that was not sustainable. It was not doable. Not every child had a computer. Not every child had connectivity. We did 
mail out, I wanna say over 30,000 paper packets for the kids. It put a lot of stress on parents who were working from home and trying to teach their children at the same time. It was, it was, it was tough for everybody. And so we recognize that. So as we've worked through the summer and we've worked with the union and others to try to figure out what do we do? How do we go from here? What's expected of us? What's required of us? How do we make it as safe as possible in our schools? We've come up with a few options. We originally had a more of a hybrid mix kind of in the set, but right before we were due to have our work session on reopening the schools and what that looked like, the Department of Education, uh, Commissioner Corcoran came out with his emergency order. And in that emergency order, it gave us a lot of flexibility in our innovative plan for seat time and attendance and whatnot for funding flexibility that we desperately need right now. But it also mandated that schools must open five days a week in August for all students that wish to go back to face-to-face -face instruction. So we quickly had, well, the district quickly had to scrap some of the plans that they were gonna bring before the board. They had to get rid of um, some of those plans and alter them. They were up till midnight trying to work it out. So the three plans I'm about to go over with you are the three plans that have been approved by Orange County School Board. They have been submitted to the Department of Education and they have been approved by the Department of Education, our innovative model has been approved. So we'll be offering three options. The first one is face-to-face. -face. That will begin August 21st. The second option is Launch Ed. Launch Ed is our digital platform that will mimic a classroom schedule and it'll be like you're in the classroom. So your face-to-face -face instruction and your Launch Ed will be very similar. The reason that we brought forth Launch Ed was for those students and parents that want to stay connected to their school. So if you're going to Glen Ridge Middle or you're at Winter Park High or you're at Lake Mont um, Elementary and you knew that you were already going to get a certain teacher and you choose Launch Ed, hopefully that teacher's teaching Launch Ed from home or from the classroom and that will be your teacher. That way after nine weeks, because we are asking for a nine week commitment for all these programs, right, for face-to-face -face, um, or Launch Ed. Orange County Virtual Schools will be handled a little bit differently and I'll discuss that in a moment. But we we are um, asking for a commitment and it will mimic your school day. So if you choose Launch Ed, you will have that schedule, that bell schedule from morning to afternoon, you'll get breaks, you'll be able to, um, I'm sorry, you're hearing my dog bark, I apologize. Um, you'll be able to take breaks with the class, you'll get lunch you know, at home, you'll be able to go out and do recess when the students in elementary school go to recess, you'll have time to get up and go to the restroom during you know, classroom shifts and breaks like that. There will be some pre-recorded pre -recorded, um, platforms that teachers will be using, but for the most part, you will be required to go bell to bell. Um, face to face is just like it sounds. You'll be in the classroom. We will be moving out furniture. We will be trying to social distance as much as we can. There will be disinfectants in place. In fact, I have the safe safety and healthy manual. I'm going to share my screen here in a few minutes to bring up to you to show you all the work that the district has done in putting it together to ensure the safety of our employees and students. And it's a fluid document, which means this thing will be changing um, daily as needs arise or we find something that we didn't address that needs to address. But face-to-face -face will, will look a little differently than it did in past years because we will try to keep kids in cohorts. We will try to keep them in the classroom and rotate teachers where possible so that we limit the movement of kids during lunch in the elementary and middle and high school levels, we will be utilizing the cafeteria and open areas so that we could space people, space the students out um, so that they can eat without their masks on. Masks will be required in the classroom. And I understand that's gonna be a challenge, especially for our elementary students, but we're under a mask order in Orange County right now. And we, had, we have to adhere to that mask order. Um, also in instances where we can't maintain that six feet of social distancing, we have to have masks on to ensure the safety of our students and our teachers. And we're getting ready to bring before a board an emergency order that will place that mask order in policy and in, I believe our student code of conduct for 60 or 90 days and then it, it will sunset. And then we have Orange County Virtual School. So that's very similar to Florida um, 
virtual school, we are using some of their platforms, some of their curriculum in implementing it. We have gone already from 250 students that were enrolled in Orange County virtual schools to 5,000 and that number is rising. So some teachers, especially our high risk teachers that um, don't feel comfortable teaching, maybe lunch at a <laughs> head from home or don't want to be in the classroom they are applying for orange county virtual schools as they see fit or as as they desire so those are kind of our three models and i'm going to try to share so bear with me my screen where i can show you um really quickly hang on what that that's going to look like and this worked perfectly before so give me one second let me see, let me share it this way and then go up. Okay, I want this tab. So here is a snapshot of just some very basic information of the difference between traditional face-to-face, -face, the innovative OCP, OCPS launch ed at home model that was approved by the Department of Education and virtual OCBS. So as you'll see, they're fully accredited. Um, they're all tuition free. They mean con connection to currently enrolled schools, which was really important to some of our parents and students that they maintain their connectivity with their school. So they still got to see their classmates. And if they did wish to go back to face-to-face -face after the nine weeks, it's a seamless transition. You go from launch at home to the same classroom, to the same kids that you, you've seen on your computer for the last nine weeks. Um, and then of course, students will need to wear personal protective equipment in the face-to-face. -face. The district will be using CARES money to provide some of those masks for those who can't afford it or don't have it, we'll be providing hand sanitizer, all the necessary sanitizing equipment needed for um, brick and mortar schools. So the location for traditional face-to-face, -face, it's will be in our traditional school building. Um, for launch ed, they will be at home for the first nine weeks. We were looking at some type of hybrid model where kids could come into school, maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then work from home Tuesdays and Thursdays. The district decided not to do that the first nine weeks because the COVID numbers were so large um, when we were looking at this model. So for the first nine weeks, we are asking that everybody who choose launch ed to do so from home. And then we will revisit that after the nine weeks for those who may want to come to campus but don't feel comfortable being on campus for a full um, five days, maybe offering a hybrid model to where you can come back two days or three days a week. It would just need to be consistent. Um, your days would have to be consistent on and off so that logistically we can make sure that there was enough social distancing and we could practice good social measures to keep people safe. OCVS obviously will be from home. Teachers will teach classes in the school building with lunch ed and face-to-face. -face. If they're face-to-face, -face, obviously the teachers will be in the classrooms. There will be some teachers that will have a hybrid mix, which means they'll have students in their classroom and students online that they're teaching at the same time. We will have teachers that will be teaching lunch ed from home, from their home to students from home, and then we will have teachers that will be teaching lunch ed from their classroom with no students in the classroom then just teaching from their classroom. And we did a survey of our parents and of our teachers, and I'll get into those results in a minute. Those results are fluid, and we're still reaching out to parents because we hadn't heard from everybody um, as of Friday. Um, so the time, the standard school year calendar, August through June for all three, the standard school day start and end times for face-to-face -face and launch ed at home, Orange County Virtual obviously will offer you a more flexible option. You'll be able to work more at your own pace. There will be more live recording sessions that you could um, utilize. The teachers will still be in Orange County and there'll be a lot more services available to students who choose Orange County Virtual Schools versus Florida Virtual Schools because we have control over Orange County Virtual Schools and we can offer tutoring and extra um, resources as needed for those students. Orange County Virtual School will have a complete flexibility in lessons 24 seven. Face-to-face -face and launch at at home will not have that flexibility. Um, learning students required to attend live classes or lessons daily will be required for face-to-face -face and launch ed. There will be daily live lessons for those as well. Classes taught by OCPS teachers will happen across all three platforms or models. Um, students devices will be provided. We will be giving each student a one-to-one -one, um, computer. Even those that choose Orange County Virtual Schools will be handing that student 
a computer as well. And if there's connectivity issues, if that child does not have internet at home and needs an extra boost um, of connectivity, we will provide hotspots as well to make sure that they're connected and ready to go. Um, students will have access to our G Suite. Students will have access to Canvas and all the platforms. And students will have access to our Launchpad pad on all three platforms. The students in our secondary level are already used to these platforms. We, we've been a one-to-one -one device uh, school district for a couple years now. So if you have a middle school student or a high school student, they're already familiar with G, G Suite, Canvas, Launchpad, Google, and some of the other platforms that we've been teaching off of. So that's kind of the breakdown on the reopening model matrix for our family. We did give a survey out um, to our teachers and our parents. 30% of the parents came back and said they, they choose face-to-face -face for their students. I think it was like 40%, don't quote me because I don't have the numbers right in front of me, chose Launch Ed. Um, and then very few, 5%, chose Orange County Virtual School. It's still fluid, so those numbers could change. We are still reaching out to quite a few different um, parents that we haven't heard from. So hopefully our numbers will change. So that it might have been like the 50, 60 percentage for parents that are choosing um, launch ed for the first nine weeks. And then we went out to our teachers too, and we gave them first, second, third choice. So those who chose to do launch ed at home um, as our first, first choice, we are going to, to look at you know, the needs of our employees. So the high risk, high needs employees, obviously we need to ensure that they're safe and we're keeping them safe. So if launch ed was their first choice and they want to do it from home, we're gonna try to do everything within our power to help our high risk first and then kind of move down the line. We are working with some that our resource teachers or whatnot, because resource teachers kind of need to be in a, in a brick and mortar building that if they're not in a situation where it's safe for them to be there and it's risky for them to be there, we're trying to get them moved over to Orange County Virtual School or we're trying to work with them on an individual basis to try to accommodate as many teachers as we can. We've been saying from the beginning that we need to be compassionate. Um, we need to operate um, with grace and we need to be as flexible as we can because we are in unprecedented times and no matter how much we plan, how much we put together, we put forward, um, there's going to be something that we haven't thought of or there's going to be something that we missed that we're going to have to go back and kind of fix and say, you know, that didn't occur to us. Let's, let's add that now. So we're just asking for everybody to be patient with us. We really have really good intentions and we've trying to be very thoughtful in how we approach this. I know that we, we threw some teachers and parents for a loop when we decided to go to the old, back to our current calendar, which said teachers go back on the 31st, students will start on the 10th. The reason that we, we made that change and we went back to the current calendar was we were trying to get teachers um, not to have to wait an extra two weeks for their paycheck, especially in light of where we are at, in Orange County as an economy and with so many people being furloughed and so many spouses being furloughed, we didn't want our teachers and our classified staff and those who were counting on getting a paycheck on a certain day not to receive that paycheck. And so we were trying to accommodate them and accommodate our students at the same time. So we thought if we go virtual and we have the kids come back virtually August 9th or August 10th, excuse me, and we will be very flexible with that. Um, we thought that would give us the time to have everybody get up and running on launch ed. We could work out the kinks, we could work out the bugs. Those children that didn't think they have connectivity issues might find out that they do have connectivity issues. That way we could get a hot spot into their hands so there's no learning loss. And in case we have to pivot over to launch ed because that will be our, our distance learning model or our remote learning model, we will not be going back to how we taught in spring. We will going back to launch ed, which means it will be a bell to bell schedule if we have to close a school due to an outbreak or due to a spread or due to needing to quarantine large groups of people. We will just pivot to the launch ed and we need everybody up and running and understanding how that model works so that it can kind of be a seamless transition from face to face to launch ed if needed. I'm hoping we don't need it, but it's better to be prepared than not prepared as we move forward in these uncertain times where we just don't know where this pandemic is going to take us. So that's kind of our plans. That's where we are. As a school board, we did ask for a waiver from the governor to allow us 
to make the decision on when to start. Right now in our innovative plan, it says August 21st, we were very clear that if we didn't feel that that was safe, we wanted the opportunity to revisit that date as needed as we got closer and we did ask for a waiver. The governor's kind of come back and said, it's within your right to decide when to open up schools, um, not ours, and they feel like the waiver is very clear. Our legal uh, department kind of differs in that it was very clear that if you don't open brick and mortar five days a week, that they have the ability to hold funding. And we haven't gotten anything in writing that says that they won't withhold funding if we go or if they'll even approve our plan because any change in date at this point would require us to submit a new plan to the Department of Education on a change of date on when we're open our brick and mortar schools. There's been several counties in South Florida that have deferred the opening. They will be starting digitally, Miami-Dade, Broward County, and Palm Beach County. And they are able to do so because they are still in phase one where Orange County is in phase two. So where we're in phase two and we're allowed to have 50 people in a room together, as long as we can social distance and make it as safe as possible, we are allowed to do so, which is why we're in a different situation than Miami-Dade, Broward, or Palm Beach County. We have created a medical advisory committee. I'm really proud. It's gonna be like, I think nine to 11 members of experts in, in different fields from infectious diseases to pediatrics, um, to epiology, which I don't think I said that right, but we've really gotten a really good group of experts to come together to look at our, our plan, which I'm gonna share with you now because we did um, develop a plan. So if you get an opportunity, please go on to our website and look through our COVID-19 health and safety procedure manual. In this manual, you will find everything that you need to know about our plan to keep our employees and students safe in our brick and mortar buildings. It also has a protocols on what's in place if a child gets sick during the day. It has protocols in place on what happens if someone tests positive for COVID-19, whether that's a teacher or a student, what procedures will we follow, how will we notify all those involved, and, and what will that look like. So I if you have a few minutes, please take the time to kind of read through this. Um, Safety, it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, it's all about at home, at school, in the classroom. It talks about preventative measures, what we're going to be doing, classways in between, restrooms, how we'll be sanitizing, what it's gonna look like, what we're gonna be asking of our students, what we're gonna be asking of our employees. It will give parents a really good indication of what school's gonna look like, because I keep telling parents, this is gonna look different. Like, I know that children really wanna come back to school. I want children really back in school. I know that that's the best learning environment for our students is one that's in a brick and mortar building in front of a teacher, especially our ELL students, our ESC students, and um, our, our students with special needs. So I want them back in the classroom. But this will give you a good idea of what it's going to look like because I know that I've spoke to many of my friends and they're like, my kid, my child is just so excited. They want to go back. They want to see their friends. I don't know what to do. I don't think it's safe for them to be in the brick and, brick and mortar building just yet, but I don't know what decision to make. And what I've been telling them is it's going to look far different because right now we only have 30% 30, 30 of the people said that they want to come back brick and mortar, which means you're looking at very small classrooms, which is what we need. We're encouraging parents um, to do launch ed if they're able to do so, to keep their kids home for that first nine weeks so that we can mitigate the risk and the spread. We're also asking parents, if you can, to please carpool. Please, you know, get with your neighbors and carpool to school if you've chosen that face-to-face -face option so that we can limit the amount of people on a bus so that we can spread those out that have no other choice but to get to school by bus, um, to put them on there safely to keep those kids safe. So we're really asking for community involvement and community help as we work through this pandemic. But again, if you do get a chance, I, I would suggest that you look over this um, this health and safety guide and give me feedback if there's something in there that you're like, hey, you guys missed the mark on this or you don't have this or you didn't really address this, you might want to look into this, please let me know because as I mentioned, this is a very fluid document and it will change um, often as we move forward and as things pop up that we feel that we need to address. Um, so that's our health and safety guide. I talked to you about the waiver. Um, we're still looking into it. Um, we're trying to balance 
to create a balance for the need for these students to be in a brick and mortar building so that we can have our eyes on them. There's a lot, we recognize that there's a lot of students that are not in safe homes. We recognize there's a lot of students that kind of checked out after spring break and there wasn't a lot of learning that happened and they regressed. So we need, we need to find out who those students are and we need to make sure that they're on track. We need to make sure that they're on track for this year. We need to make sure that the, that regression doesn't continue to happen and we do everything we can through support services to get those students to where they need so that they can reach their full potential. That's our number one goal. We have a really good plan in place for Launch Ed for our ESE, our EL students. We had to kind of write it out in order for our plan to be approved by the Department of Education. Is it perfect? No it's digital, right? We're gonna to try to offer as many services as we can, one-on-one -on -one services, but it's not the same as being in a classroom. So those in that situation where a child needs to be back in a classroom and they can't wear a mask, we're looking at what type of PPE we can provide to the teacher, to the student that makes sense with their disabilities, that we could get the teacher, keep the teacher safe and she could still teach. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot to consider. A lot of time when you look at speech therapy or occupational therapy, they use their mouths. You know, they're, they tell the students, look at me, you know, when they pronounce words or do certain things, having a mask on will prevent that. So maybe we need to look at the plastic mask or maybe a plastic mask and a shield to keep the teacher safe so that they can still communicate and do that one-on-one -on -one with the student. So these are all the conversations that are taking place behind the scenes at the district that our departments are trying to figure out and do the best job that they can for the well-being of our students and our teachers. Um, I think that I've covered everything that I wanted to cover. Um, if teachers do get sick, there's been a lot of questions about what happens to the teachers. Will they have to use their sick time? I was told the answer is no. We'll, we'll place them on temporary duty while they get tested until they get the test results back. If they test negative, then obviously they can come back to work. If they test positive, then they will need to be quarantined and need to take care of themselves um, until they feel better. If they're asymptomatic and they feel comfortable doing lunch ed from home and working, they feel well enough, we'll allow that to happen. If not, they'll kind of be on temporary duty, still getting paid, but I was told they will not have to use their sick time. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we're trying to be very flexible and operate, you know, with compassion and grace. So, that's really all I kind of wanted to go over with you today. I know that there's lots of questions, so I want to stop talking so that I can allow those of you who have questions to kind of ask them so that we can kind of walk through this together because we're only going to get through this pandemic together and we need tons of community support to get there. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to Tiffany. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Angie, for uh, sharing this update with us and with the community and parents. I know um, they're very appreciative. So thank you for being with us today. Um, as Angie mentioned, we are opening the floor up for some audience submitted questions. If you are watching on Zoom, uh, go ahead and click that Q&A feature, uh, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You can input your question there and we will read it off to Angie. If you are watching via Facebook Live, feel free to drop a comment um, in the comment section below with uh, a question there. Um, let me see what we have here. Uh, we have something from Kim Wagen who said thank you for this informative session, Angie. Yeah. Um, so yes, any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the, the chat box or the Q&A. I see we have one that just came in um, from Kim Wagen. Are there restrictions on extracurricular activities this school year? So yes and no. So for clubs, it's my understanding we're going to try to move forward with clubs just, just like we would. We'll, we'll socially distance. Um, we'll be as safe as possible, but we are going to move forward to clubs, which means even if your child chooses launch ad and then wants to come to face-to-face -face for a club or a meeting, that will be allowed. That's the whole purpose of launch ed is to keep your kid connected to school. We're looking at sports. I think we've been given the clear, I think, to do golf, to do... Um, What's another one? Tennis, some other sports that are fall sports that we've been given the go ahead to. Swimming, we're still waiting to see. Not because we can't do it, but we have a, we use outside um, swimming pools. So like we use the Y and we use other pools that they haven't opened their pools yet. So we're, we're in, we're in the process of having those conversations to see if we can get the pools up and running. But we did, I believe, open up 
our pools, like at Winter Park, I believe the Winter Park pool has been open. We've been renting it out, I think, to the Blue Dolphins and to others. And I think swimming practice was going to begin soon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we're still having issues with band and with football. So while each school is operating a little differently and conditioning is continuing to happen, it's on a school by school basis based on the athletic director and the coaches. The FSHSA, is that what it's called? F I always get the acronym wrong, but it's the FHSAA. Uh, their medical advisory team came in and they, didn't, they recommended that we halt any type of practice that was to begin on July 27th until further notice due to the COVID numbers being so high um, in Orange County and across the state. They came out and said, you know what, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna leave it up to the district. Orange County district, you know, chose to do the right thing and says, you know, until we get further notice, until we know what we're dealing with, we're going to suspend practice until we can figure this out. Then the FHSAA had an emergency meeting and said no sports until July or until August 24th. And they're gonna revisit it, I think August 10th or 11th, they're gonna have another meeting and revisit. So we're waiting to see what comes out of that just to, to figure out how to proceed with football. I'm a big football fan. I love football and I'm hoping that we can get to a place um, to where we can play this fall and figure it out. I know that we have we have football players that are depending on us to do that. They're looking for scholarships. They're looking to go away to college on a scholarship and we need to have that football. It's recruitment season. So we're looking at that and we take that very seriously. The same with band. You know, we have a lot of seniors that are in band and we don't, we don't want them not to have the senior year that they were expecting. So we're looking at that as well, but we have to do it safely and we have to do it cautiously and in the right manner. So we're in the process of reviewing all of that, but with band and with football, which was scheduled to start July 27th, we have postponed that until further notice and, and we'll, we'll be addressing that soon. Wonderful, thank you for answering that, Angie. Um, okay, so we have a couple more questions coming in uh, from Susan Adams. How is music education being handled? What about art classes? That's a great question. So we're still working through some of the kinks with that. With music, depending um, on the instrument and where they are, we, it, you know, if they choose launch ed, we, we, we can do music virtually. Like we could have them teaching and, and people simultaneously working on music. We saw it happen during graduations where the bands or the choir group would get together and they would be on Zoom and they would be playing together. So I feel like music virtually might be a little bit easier than music face to face, but we're, we're, we're committed. We're committed to, to music. So we'll, we'll figure out a way to make it safe so that students can still participate. Um, and then with art, same thing, we're committed to art. We've just got to figure out what that looks like for our kids at home, how we get them the supplies we, we do. We may need to adjust our curriculum a little bit, but we are committed to our electives. We're not removing electives in launch ed or in face-to-face. -face. So I hope that answers your question. We don't, I don't know what it looks like right now, but we're committed, we're, we're committed to the electives. Wonderful, thank you, Angie. Um, okay, and we have one more question. Uh, are there restrictions to outside organizations who partner with the school, extracurricular organizations, um, to being on campus in person? So there's new rules in place. So if you were a um, vendor with, or a contractor with Orange County in the past where you rented our facilities, whether it was for um, flag football or Little League or swim or any anything, brownies, Girl Scouts, whatever. Um, you, we're renting, we started renting, I think in July, we started renting our facilities out again. There's just a liability waiver. There's some different paperwork that you have to um, adhere to. You have to prove to us how you're keeping the kids safe and how you're being responsible with sanitizing and social distancing so that kids don't get, don't, spread the disease or get COVID-19. It's more of a safety precaution or liability issue. But yes, we are, we, we began uh, renting our facilities in July. So please, if you have, if you have a need, you know, reach out to us and, and our people downtown will, will hook you up and get you what you need. 
Wonderful. Well, it looks like those were all the questions we received. It looks like you answered the majority in your presentation, which was very um, informative. So thank you again so much, Angie, for being with us today. I know you're very busy, so we very much appreciate you taking the time to being on, on our Winter Park Professional Women webinar this afternoon. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And if anybody has any questions that they think of later, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, I always encourage you to reach out to your principals and your local people for information too. They have a wealth of information, but if you ever need me, if you have a question or an issue, feel free. I, my door is always open. So please feel free to email me or call me. Fantastic. Thank you again, Angie. And thank you to Orlando Health, um, our presenting sponsor for Winter Park Professional Women, uh, and Elizabeth Watkins for being with us today. We appreciate your time as well and your support um, throughout the past several years for our program. Um, just a couple of reminders. We ask that all of our attendees, if you are not already, to follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram, and subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we have two newsletters that go out, RSVP, which is our event newsletter that goes out every Monday, and then Winter Park Weekly, which goes out every Thursday with some updates for member news as well as local uh, government news um, that goes out each week as well. So um, subscribe to that if you are not already. Uh, we have one more webinar coming up this week. That's Good Morning Winter Park. That's going to be on Friday, August 7th at 10 a.m. and we will be hearing it from Orange County Mayor, uh, Mayor Jerry Deming. So he will be with us this Friday. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, if you'd like to check back to this webinar, it will be sitting on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube page as evergreen content. So feel free to visit it again if you would like to check back or share it with any of your peers. Thank you again so much for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.